introduce uh, Kyle Kastner from Southwest Research Institute. Oh, okay, you'll reactivate your... Um, he will tell us about a gentle introduction to machine learning for the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Uh, standing room only looks really great. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the machine learning track of SciPy 2013. Uh, as was stated, my name is Kyle Kastner, and I'm here today to give a brief introduction to machine learning. I'm sure some of you guys in this room are very familiar. Uh, I come from an electrical engineering background, and I just started getting into machine learning. And I thought, what better way to get other people introduced than to share my own trials and tribulations? So my brief outline, why do we want to use machine learning? What is our workflow? I'll also provide some in-depth resources for further exploration, and also provide some nice sound bites for implementing these things for your work. So why do we use machine learning? We're drowning in data in this world. Look around the room. Computers are everywhere. Everything's logging. Everything's talking. The volume of data available is beyond the scale of human comprehension. So it's really important to remember that we have lots of computers. So why not take advantage of that and use that to make better decisions? That leads right into my next point. Computers are cheap. Humans are expensive. An hour of Amazon EC2 GPU cluster time is $2.10 an instance hour. That's very cheap compared to the hour cost, even for a grad student. <laughs> Most importantly, machine learning can give you psychic superpowers. Sometimes. If your model's right, if your data matches your model, so on and so forth. But it's a really nice feeling when it happens. So a couple examples of types of problems we find in machine learning. Uh, there's typically a lot more than this, but uh, regression problems happen often. Um, Basically, given some input, uh, it could be multi-dimensional input, we want to predict some output. A great example of this is housing prices. Given the size of a garage, given the size of a yard, given the niceness of the neighborhood, given how close it is to a school, how much do we think a house will cost? Classification is another important area of machine learning, specifically if we have thing one and thing two and they have some attributes or features, how do we look at features and say, oh, this is thing one, or this is thing two. A classic example of this is handwritten, rigid, handwritten digit recognition, um, specifically MNIST digits, which I will get into later in the slides. There's also another type of problem called clustering. Um, this particular type of problem is different than the previous two mentioned. You'll see on the side, I've noted supervised versus unsupervised. All this means is supervised problems typically have a training data set where you have a set of features and you have the output, you use the output to train and then get new data that may or may not have labels associated with it. Uh, clustering is typically used on unsupervised data. This is just raw stuff. Um, there's a lot more unsupervised data out there, but it's much harder to deal with. A good example of clustering is document tagging. Given a word count list of words in a document, maybe we want to say, this is a political document, or this is divorce papers, or this is a blog about cats, or this is a sci-fi talk, or anything that, of that nature. So, data. Let's talk about data. Um, there are some really great data sets embedded in our Python framework uh, from scikit-learn, which I highly recommend to pretty much everyone. Uh, the iris and digits data sets are excellent for classification. The digits set is basically a set of handwritten digits. Um, and I'll show a display later that'll show that in more detail. There's also the iris data set, which has different features of plants. And the goal is to differentiate between plants based on petal lengths and things like this. There's also a Boston data set. It's a set of housing prices from Boston taken a long time ago. Um, any of you guys that were at the tutorial for uh, either data processing or scikit-learn yesterday saw this in more detail. Um, it's important to note that any classification data set sans labels makes an excellent candidate for clustering and unsupervised learning because you can run your unsupervised programs and then use those labels to make estimates of how well you're doing. Um, whereas in the real world, we don't really have any labels, so it's hard to verify whether you're doing well or poorly. Um, 
sklearn also has some very good functions for generating da data. It's near arbitrary, stuff like I want two clusters over here, I want a couple lines, maybe one line will intersect. You can really get some interesting uh, random data to test your algorithms. So uh, one of the most important steps in machine learning is pre-processing. Uh, it's glossed over in a lot of the uh, papers out there, but poor pre-processing will absolutely ruin your machine learning algorithms, and I'm sure anyone who's implemented can agree with me here. Um, some really basic steps you can take. Um, these aren't rules, these are more of guidelines. Um, you can normalize your data by subtracting the mean and dividing by the variance. Um, that puts your problems numerically in a space where they're more likely to function correctly. Um, principal component analysis, which I will not really get into too much here, uh, is very useful for reducing the dimensionality of your data and still maintaining the variant structure, uh, which is important for things like I have, in this case, a plot of the Boston housing data, which is 13 different features for 500 and something houses, uh, reduced down to two dimensions so I can make an easy scatter plot. Um, I chose the unnormalized PCA because it made a better graph. The infamous uh, cheat sheet. This is a excellent uh, guideline for if you're getting your feet wet in scikit-learn, you have some data, you don't know where you're going, uh, you can use this as kind of a guideline to explore the library itself. Um, I recommend it, and it's been very useful to me. I will also talk about a couple different areas within this graph. Um, if we can see the regression slide here, uh, I'll be talking about regression and two different classification algorithms um, due to the constraints of time, I will avoid talking about clustering directly. So linear regression, and I just noticed that my slides are off the side, that's okay. <laughs> so we wanna find the best fit line for a particular set of data. In this case, uh, this is a random data set generated with sklearn data generation tools, um, very useful once again. Um, we can see that there are three different line fits, uh, a linear line fit, um, if you can see the black wavy line uh, was a Fourier regression, uh, so it fit with a series of sine waves, and a polynomial regression. Uh, so you can see that all of these different regressions have fit to our data set, and uh, you can kind of see how that could be used to predict new data coming in. Logistic regression is a simple method for classification. Uh, its implementation is very similar in a lot of ways to linear regression. Uh, there's a slightly different cost function used, but you use the regression to split between different classes, and one of the classic examples is digit recognition. So we can see that uh, most of the digits were recognized correctly, however, uh, we see a missed label there in the center. It's hard to tell exactly what has been misclassified, but you can see that there are some identifying features that may be associated with a one. Uh, the line at the bottom, the overhanging line at the top, uh, and actually a human would have a fairly difficult time discerning what that digit really is. It's important to note that while this technique is really simple, it can also be very powerful with the right pre-processing. Um, there are more powerful pre-processing steps than principal component analysis that can really uh, help this algorithm work better. And it's an important point to note that pre-processing and your algorithm are not black box separable modules. Um, they can work together and provide a very powerful framework where either one separately may fail. Support vector machines are another classification algorithm that is kind of the gold standard black box for a lot of everyday people that are getting into machine learning. Uh, it has a margin parameter that basically allows it to miss some classifications without uh, running off the rails. If we can see in the data set right along the red and green boundary, there's a couple errors in classification. However, overall, 
uh, it does a pretty good job of classifying what goes where. In this case, this was the pedal data set. Uh, I took the example from SKLearn, slightly modified the, uh, the way it was projected to two dimensions, and then generated this graph. Um, you're also able to draw different boundaries than just linear boundaries, like I have here. Um, there's also the ability to do curved boundaries, polynomials, um, wavelet boundaries, which are a little more arbitrary, um, sigmoid boundaries. Uh, there's a lot of depth here. So a brief link to some resources and all these slides and the example code that I used to generate all of my graphs and a couple extra things that I didn't have time to put in the presentation will be available on a GitHub link that I'll show at the end. Um, the scikit-learn documentation is very, very, very good. There is a lot of examples for everything you might want to know. And there were two tutorial sessions yesterday. I'm not sure how available those will be online, but those were very excellent in-depth um, explorations of the scikit-learn framework. Uh, Coursera notes, um, the Stanford machine learning class is very excellent. Now they use Octave, okay? So I know not all of you are big fans here, but um, one of the things I found very useful is to take the exercises from that course, re-implement them in Python, and I found the details there have really helped me understand a lot more about the algorithms used. Uh, Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning by Christopher M. Bishop is an excellent book for both mathematical depth and visualization of a whole bunch of algorithms, uh, and I recommend it very highly. So some final comments. Uh, machine learning is a spectrum. It pulls in a lot of uh, techniques from statistics, from uh, applied math. Uh, there's a lot of overlap with digital signal processing, which is how I originally started exploring more. Um, and it goes everything from applied statistics to trying to invent Skynet, invent the next AI. Um, it's pretty interesting and there's a lot of disagreement about what the best path is, but it's important to remember that it's all very interesting and it is all useful in certain situations. Uh, data pre-processing is absolutely vital. Uh, if you do your pre-processing wrong or incorrectly, um, reading a research paper or something, there may be one line of, we pre-processed pre our data set doing blah. If you skip that line, you may have a very hard time recreating the results. In general, uh, try to prefer simple models to complex ones. Uh, some people disagree, but complex models tend to pick out specific things in your data set, whereas simple models tend to ignore a lot of the details and a lot of the noise in your data and get more towards a ground truth. Uh, most importantly, use SKLearn. Use it a lot. It is your friend. Go through the tutorials. Um, there's a, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, finally, I'm open for questions. Um, this is the link to all the code on GitHub. Feel free to go there, pull it, yell about how bad my code is. It's all good. Uh, and now I'm opening the floor for questions, so anybody? Okay, I see a question here. What was uh, your background prior to getting into machine learning? So my background prior to getting into machine learning was uh, electrical engineering primarily. Uh, started focused primarily on signal processing for audio and communications and slowly getting into higher and higher level signal processing started to see a lot of overlap between machine learning and signal processing. Um, a lot of the uh, best benchmarks for speech recognition uh, start coming from the machine learning community which naturally leads you to say, hey, what is this all about anyways? Uh, I saw another question in the back. The examples, uh, the examples for the uh, slides I've done here are all in this repository, yes. And they're all just regular Python. I have recently discovered the beauty of the IPython notebook. For anyone that hasn't started using it, please do so. It's, it's incredible. Can you give an example of the psychic superpowers you mentioned at the beginning? Of the <laughs> okay. Found something that you might not have 
Okay, so the best example of psychic super... Oh, so the question was, uh, can you give an example of the psychic superpowers you mentioned at the start of your talk? Uh, the best example of psychic superpowers that uh, I can mention is that the digit recognition that I showed earlier with logistic regression. There are several more advanced methods of implementing this, and actually the Postal Service has been a really great driver of research in that area. Um, basically, they've replaced nearly all of their uh, postal code recognition uh, with machine learning algorithms, and I believe the error is down to maybe 0.8%. Uh, some really incredible work that basically turns snail mail into email. It goes into a big center, a bunch of computers analyze it, and send it out the door with humans again. Um, that's pretty super powery, in my opinion. You mentioned SQL learning. Uh, have you used other machine learning libraries? Are any any big ones worth to mention? Uh, I mentioned SK Learn. Uh, the question was, are there any other machine learning libraries I'd like to mention? Uh, one of the big things that I've seen in SKLearn that was really interesting is there's a lot of focus on what's considered feature engineering or feature detection. Uh, there's a lot of talk on the mailing list and the forums about implementing some of the new research called deep learning or deep neural networks. Uh, there are some other Python libraries that escape my brain at the moment. Uh, that implement these in some level, and uh, it's another—it's kind of a separate path to feature recognition. And if I could remember the name, I would recommend it to you. It's—it's it's a very interesting research front. Okay, it's PyLearn two, so I highly recommend that as well for exploring another side of machine learning. Are you aware of any clustering uh, algorithms that work with genetic data? The question was, are you aware of any clustering algorithms that work with genetic data? And the answer is no, but I am pretty sure there are some. And somebody in this room probably has a lot of expertise with that.